You know, every person sitting in here, you've defined life for yourself. You got a definition of life. And so when I begin to bring the definition of life today, as God has defined it, you might disagree with me. But reality of it is, you not disagree with me. You're disagreeing with what the Word of God says, that the Word of God that we call the Bible. So today we're going to talk to you about the Bible. I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of people mistaken about a lot of things, even in concerning the Bible. I've watched as so many, and they say that Bible, the Bible is the number one bestseller. And you know, it may be the number one bestseller, but I'm certain it's not the number one best reader. <laughs> I'm certain of that because there's just too few people that really understand what the book says. There's few, too, too, peop, few too many. And the few and the many seem to, don't seem to fit the same sentence. There's too little people that really have grabbed a hold of what Jesus came 2,000 years ago to do that is so effective and so real right now that when you begin to touch that realm for what it really is, it causes joy to bust loose in your soul. It causes life all of a sudden to enter into you and you begin to have experiences and have feelings and emotions that never before has, have you ever even had. <laughs> People go try to find emotions. They try to find feelings. They try to know love. I, I think one song wrote, wrote, writer wrote, looking for love in all the wrong places. That's a very accurate statement. <laughs> because it's only found in one place, but men seek it in all different kinds of ways only to find themselves just being thrashed by what they ultimately reach out to take hold of. I'm so blessed to have my little grandbaby with us today. She's got a little sister on the way. And I'm really stoked. <laughs> Allie, say hello to everybody. Just come over here and say hello. She's not gotten fat. Wouldn't that be a funny joke? I just showed up a little bigger. Hi, church. We miss you guys. We are so blessed to be here. <laughs> this is such a glorious place on earth. <laughs> you know what was totally dropped in my spirit during worship is that so many people are here for miraculous provision. <laughs> and thankfully, we have a Father that will supply abundantly above all we could ever imagine or ask for. So I believe... I believe a lot of you and every one of you will be blessed today with yeah. a miracle of provision. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Father does have a miracle for you, but you're going to have to expect one. Did you know that? Did you know that? Did you know that, that God has a miracle waiting for you right now? There's a miracle. Anything that you ask is a miracle, but you've got to expect it. You know, what, you, know what the, you know what miracle I want today? I want the miracle of a greater manifestation in the presence of the living God. Because I have tasted of this realm of glory and it is love personified. It is so much love. People, say, people want to have evaluations in their mind. Prove to me that God is real. I can prove to you that God is real. He has proven himself to me by his very presence. He's caused me to feel a love that is nowhere else found on the planet and no one else knows unless they know him. It's true. You know, I was talking to the other person the other day and he was from Nigeria and I said, well, do you know TB over there, TB Joshua? He said, yeah, TB is an amazing man of God. Man, the presence of God, you feel the presence of God get around TV. Yeah, you do. He's a man of God. He's a wonderful man of God. People don't like him because he jumps into the river where the alligators swim around because he just wants to go swimming. And the alligators don't bother him. Anybody else gets in the river, they're going to get eaten up. And so people say, oh, you know, he must be a witch doctor. No. No, no, no just not witch doctors that close the, the mouths of alligators and the mouths of lions. Men of God do. People who stand in his presence. God's very real. But what's happened in America and in the Western world, we've reduced God to nothing more than religion. Religion. Religion can never feel God. 
Religion can never experience God. The big difference between religion and relationship is religion has all of an outward form, but when, you, when a person is religious, praise, you don't feel nothing. Well, when a person who is, has a relationship with God begins to worship, begin to praise, all of a sudden you're overwhelmed with something you've never felt before. <laughs> and the reality of it is, when the powers of darkness that hold you in a state of blindness in temporary insanity, in part, deception, can't see th- right, can't think right. When that is removed, when that was removed by the miracle of God's love and provision, hallelujah, that love begins to overwhelm your soul in such a way it passes knowledge. And there you get filled up with all the fullness of God. And I'm telling you, that is explosive on the inside of you. And that's why people run around the church. <laughs> so I said, I went to church, a bunch of crazy people, man. They were running around. Hey, listen, if we were outside, we'd just take off running outside. But my goodness, when, look, when you're overwhelmed by the presence of God, it's too much, it's too much energy, too much overwhelming. You know what I mean? You've got to jump so high and leap so far. And this is glorious. It's more than you can contain. And then after a while, you get used to being in the presence of the Lord and just bust forth out of you with songs of praise and worship. And, and, and just as that praise and as that worship goes forth stronger and stronger through our lives, a manifestation of God's presence begins to overwhelm us even with a greater intensity. So many people are stuck in religion. They think that Jesus came to the earth 2,000 years ago and died for our sins so that we can continue sinning. So that we can become a church member. So that we can now be religious and have really nothing changed about our nature. Nothing changed about our attitude. Nothing changed about our appetites. But now we're going to heaven. Not true. Not true. The Bible doesn't say that at all. God makes known very clearly in His Word... How he feels about sin and iniquity. He feels about sin and iniquity like you and I feel about disease and death. Can you imagine that? Anybody want to come hang out with disease and death? Nobody wants to hang out with disease and death. You're going the other way. You're going to put it in the ground and bury it deep. Are you listening to me? Jesus came to take away the sin, to remove it from off of us, to bring to us a means by which now we can begin to understand why God is who He is and why He does what He does. Why is He the way He is? To experience His life because spiritually, all that men know is death. And they're, they're, they're captured in that realm. And Father has come in His love and grace and mercy to deliver us from that realm. He's amazing God of love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It would be far easier for me to die for something than for me to say to my son, Joshua, come here. You're going to go die for this something. Father allowed Abraham, a man who would be willing to know him in such a way that he would do anything the Father asked. He came to know how loving, how benevolent, how good, how full of grace and mercy God was. And so that when God asked Abraham to do something, he did not withhold anything from him. Because he knew he could safely trust his soul in the hands of an almighty God who he came to know as El Shaddai, the Almighty. (laughs) And there he showed him, he, uh, he showed us, and, co- and he partnership with Father as he took Isaac, his promised son, and was willing there to offer him on an altar sacrifice to worship. What a prize Abraham was willing to pay to worship. To worship is to interact with the living God. It's not to sing a song. It's not to do a religious genuflex. Father, I ask that the mind-blinding spirits, the tormenting powers of darkness that vex the souls of people in this place, 
I ask you, Father, in your mercy that it would be broken. For, Lord, they've been entrapped by religion and lies. And they don't know any better. Father, today in your mercy, I pray that every soul in this place will have an encounter with you. Father, I pray that every person in this place will be able to step outside of the influences of the God of this world and be able to consider your goodness. In Jesus' mighty name. In Acts chapter 3 and verse 19... We hear the apostles preaching. This is Peter. He says, repent. Repent, therefore, and be converted. People want to repent, but they don't want to be converted. Converted is to be changed. Repent is to be changed. So really God's saying, change, and I said change and I mean it. Repent is to change. To be converted is to change. To be converted is, means to more than to change. It means to receive a miracle new birth to where you start all over. You start all over in, in, in such a radical way. It's like it's being born again. Because when you were born of your earthly parents, you were spiritually dead. You were spiritually separated, cut off from God, could not understand God, can't understand His ways. All you can understand is humanism. All you can understand is pragmatism. All you can understand is earthly values. After all, you got to get an education. you got to make a way for yourself. you got to make money. you got to make fame. Whatever it is that has captivated a people's lives. I was watching people in the Olympics, I mean, you know, doing the skeleton thing. Sliding down, you know, on their belly, head first. I'm thinking, how do you get interested in that? <laughs> and then I'm thinking, how many hours a day are devoted to that? I mean, they had four years of intense training for like, what? It's like a minute 59 seconds? To, to, I mean, one person's going to win. Well, the Lord Jesus says life is worth running a race for to win. Life is worth doing something to win it. To win it, to have it, to lay hold on eternal life, which is the life of God. You know, people, they, they mistaken these words and these phrases for wrong meanings. They put wrong value on it. Because when we say eternal life, we're talking about the unlimited, unlimited immeasurable life of God. What would you do to have that? Father's made a way in which it comes to us as a gift. We have to repent. I'm telling you right now, the majority of people in this city are only religious. They do not know God. They fill the churches, but they've never been born again. Their nature hasn't been changed. Their value system hasn't been changed. Their ability to overcome sin is, is nil. They're just religious. They came to a church meeting, and, and, and everybody, you know, basically convinced them to join a membership with the right program. And this program is going to get you to heaven. And so they go on living the same kind of life that they've always lived with the same kind of desires, with the same kind of issues and the same kind of problems. There's no repentance. There's no conversion. Jesus came preaching the gospel of repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now I want you to consider something about repentance. Let's say that you just met a new person and you, they just, you just befriend them and you have invited them over to the house. And they come over several times. But then shortly after meeting them, you started discovering that things were missing from your yard and from your garage and even from your house. And then suddenly you just uh, further discovered that this new friend was taking this stuff and stealing it because you saw it in his yard. What are you going to do? Well, most people can say 911. They can call the police. Then maybe a few would just say, hey, don't even come back around here anymore. Huh? I'm, I gave you my friendship and look what you did with it. Well, what if the person was to come and repent? What would you do? Huh? What would you do? I know what you do. I know what most people do. We've done far worse to God. And he's allowed us to repent. But okay, so, so let's just say that you're filled with the love of God, the grace of God. 
and you forgive them when they repent. And then right off the bat, they start taking more stuff. <laughs> Did they repent? Have you repented? Have you repented? Have you changed? Have you found the power to be good? <laughs> to do what's right? To obey Papa God? Have you found the power of a changed nature to where it's your desire to do what's right, to do what's good, to do what pleases the Lord, to walk in things called holiness. People think that holiness is something that belongs to the Old Testament. No, holiness is the nature of God. It's what belongs to God Almighty. And we've been allowed by the Spirit of holiness who is called the Holy Spirit to step into the holies of holies, which is where I'm speaking from right now. And God's calling all men everywhere to repent. To escape a wrath that is to come upon all the ungodly. You could say that you, I, everybody says they love God. Oh well, most people, religious people, Hindus, they love God. Buddhists, love God. Jewish people, love God. Muslim, love God. Christians, love God. She said, if you love me, you obey me. If you love me, you'll take a hold of this life that I have to give you. And fundamental, fundamental to obedience to Christ Jesus is to be changed. To, re, to, to repent and be converted. To receive the miracle of a new life. That is fundamental to the obedience to Jesus. It's not all these other things. For when a man's heart's change, everything else changes too. When you have a change on the inside, when you, maybe you were born sad, miserable. You get changed by the power of God, you get converted and become happy and blessed. Huh? That's the change. What's wrong with that change? Oh, man, I don't want holiness. Why? Holiness is joy unspeakable and full of glory. I don't want holiness. Why? It's peace that passes understanding. Men want to make it deeds and actions. Well, deeds and actions will come out of joy unspeakable and full of glory. Deeds and actions will come out of peace that passes understanding. Deeds and actions will come out of love that goes beyond all knowledge. But it's about the love. It's about the joy. It's about the peace. It's about the fruits and the evidence that God lives on the inside of you. That Christ Jesus is your Lord and the Holy Spirit has changed you. God invites everybody everywhere to repent. Well, you say, well, I've repented. Good. Then you've found the power to overcome everything that is bad and evil. You've found the power to say no to unholy desires. <laughs> and, and, and you've more than anything else that is all defined within the realm. And now you get to love God and, he, and you get to receive the love that he has to give. Because what happens is everybody can say they love God, but the Lord Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. And if you obey me, then, then, it's an if-then clause. How many people know what an if-then clause is? If you obey me, if you love me, you will obey me, then my Father will love you. And we will come and make our dwelling with you. That's relationship. That's relationship. That's not religion. Somebody said, oh, he's very religious. He's in the church all the time. No, I'm not religious. Religion is ritual. It's an observance without the ability to interact. It's the observance of God without the ability to interact with God. <laughs> I'm not here trying to earn anything. I'm here captivated, arrested by divine presence. That when Moses saw that presence on Mount Sinai, oh, his heart and life's desire was changed. He came back after having great signs and wonders and miracles in the land of Egypt as God used him to deliver the people of Israel out of slavery. And he said, oh God, i got to see more of you. Where are you at? Show yourself. And Father showed himself in such an awesome and amazing way. He spoke audibly. To all the people of Israel, they stopped up their ears and said, no, 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 we can't bear to hear him speak. We're going to die listening to him. It's a feeling that we cannot even begin to maintain or deal with. You go talk to him. Then you tell us what he said. 
and we'll listen. And you know, of course, Moses said, I'm sorry about this, Lord, they, they don't listen to you. He said, I understand. He said, oh, there was a heart within them to want to know me. And Moses said, boy, I, I want to know you. Let me see you in all your glory. Father says, you can't see me in all my glory. You died. He said, I don't care. I don't care. Uh, he, basically, he said, uh, then let it be. Let, me, let it be my death. Uh, let me, just have mercy on me. Let me see you again. Let me see. Let me know you in a greater way. See, this is the heart of worship. This is the heart of worship. I'm not holding anything back from you. This is, this is where it, it, the whole concept of the fear of the Lord even begins to be defined. Today, we have little fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is to hate arrogance and pride, to hate the evil way and the fraud way, which is really is to hate the ways of men, to love men but hate their ways. God loves the world, but he hates their ways. And he says, I'm going to give you a chance. I'll make a way of escape for you because I'm telling you my wrath abides on that stuff. What we do is we try to make all of ourselves look better, don't we? Yeah, we were all of us worked real hard on it this morning. I can see it. Some of you women, you really worked hard. I mean, goodness gracious. I mean, it was a full manicure and pedicure and the whole works. I mean, it looks like it. I mean, the makeup is just on there. I mean, you're looking good. I mean, everything's just all dressed up. You scud yourself up. You're looking good. But what's, what goes on with the spiritual need? What goes on? What goes on with how we present ourselves and how we look before the presence of the Lord? How much interest do we, we put into that? How much need do we have for his approval? I only, have, I only need his approval. Somebody said, oh, you always correcting everybody. That's bad. No, it's not. It's good. The Lord said, everyone who is corrected... Is judged of the Lord and is a son. But those who will not be corrected shall be condemned with the world. Yeah. Huh? Amen. And, and so for me, when I start hearing, when I start hearing the Lord say things, when I start hearing the Lord say things, I just throw my, you know, like a correction. I just throw my arms up and go running to him like a little child and say, Papa, please help me. I'm going to go running away and say, oh, he's correcting me. He expects me to change. Yeah, he expects you to change. You know, you don't, no one likes anybody telling them, look, you got to change. You need to be different because you're not good enough. What? I can come around here if you tell me I need to change. I, I can come around here if you tell me I'm not right, not good enough. Jesus looked at Nicodemus and said, Nicodemus, you may be the ruler of the Jew and you may be in the right religion, but you're not good enough. You can't come in the kingdom like you are. You got to be changed. You got to be converted. You got to become a new creation. You got to become, you got to receive the miracle of deliverance, of salvation. Because you did when you were born of your parents. And God wants to breathe life into you by the miracle of the new birth. So you got to be born again. But Nicodemus says, how can I do that? How can I enter a second time into my mother's womb? He said, no, no. He said, this time you're going, to you're going to be born of the Holy Ghost. You're going to receive a miracle Holy Ghost change. Did you know that Jesus was born of the Holy Ghost? Did you know that? He was born of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost came upon a woman, a young virgin named Mary. And God, the eternal word, was incarnated. He was made, get rid of the big word, he was made a holy embryo. He, come on, man. He was made. He was, he said, that's a miracle. How that happened? It's a miracle. That's how it happened. He was changed. He, 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 he became. Don't tell me that an embryo isn't a fully developed human being. Because God became a holy embryo. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Our society has forsaken all concepts of the fear of the Lord. I believe that we have too much of it. What goes on in the church? They've forsaken the fear of the Lord. It wasn't 100 years ago, and pastors were reverend. They were feared, because that's what that word means, to fear. To reverend means to fear. That's what it means. 
The Greek word is Eusebius or Eusebius, whatever way you pronounce it, to fear. To fear. Huh? You really find it? I, I really like pointing people out at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33 on that verse of Scripture because it really helps. Because it tells women to fear their husbands. Ooh. <laughs> they don't go over good, does it? They don't go over good. It's a rebellious age. That's why it doesn't go over good. You don't even tell me, baby. Dial 911. He's over there. Somebody ought to arrest this guy. It's not right for him to live. You should have heard what he said. <laughs> I want to change. I want, I want God's way. This word of God describes to me what God, who God is and what, he, what he's like and what he likes and what he doesn't like, what he loves and what he hates. If you just want to please Him, if you just want to appeal to Him, if you want His approval and you're not seeking the approval of men, stop trying to find, go find approval from men. You don't need it. Just come under the, just, be, just seek the approval of the Father. And it's easy to get it. He's giving it out free. His approval. I'm going to finish reading that verse of Scripture in Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Repent, therefore, and be converted, and your sins will be blotted out. What a privilege. What a privilege. If you're a Hindu, you have to have 53,000 life cycles. I said 53,000. That's 53 with three zeros at the end of it. 53,000 life cycles as, a, as an animal or insect to pay for your sin. And then well, you better not blow it a second time around. And there's a lot of people, they work hard. Hindus work hard. There's a lot of Hindus that work hard. They take it serious. Huh? And there's no guru on the face of the earth that can tell you how to get rid of your sin, other than 53,000 life cycles. That's it. You sin? 53,000. Huh? And then I come along and say, I know how you can get rid of all your sin. You may be blotted out and erased. And instantaneously, immediately. Not religiously, but in a genuine heart of passion towards God. Because you, you come to Him wanting change. You're coming to Him like that thief. Who stole from him. And you say, I really want you to forgive me. I want a relationship with you. I'm sorry. I never want to do this again. And he's there, he's there to receive us. In fact, if it is, Jesus described it like this. He said, for him and the way it is in heaven, it's like when a man has a hundred sheep and one goes astray. He goes and he seeks the one that is astray and rejoices over finding the one that went astray more than the 99 that he still had. He goes on to describe it. He says it's like a woman who has 10 coins. She loses one coin. She's still got nine. She loses one. She gets frantic about the one. She sweeps the whole place, cleans the whole place, searching for it. Then finding the one invites all of her neighbors to come for a party for she found the one that was lost. So it is with the Lord and all the angels that are in His presence over the conversion of one lost soul. Oh, that reality would strike our hearts. That conversion would once again mean something. That fear of the Lord would once again have power. Somebody said, well, there's no conviction. There's no real strong Holy Ghost conviction. That's right, because everybody's lost reverence. They've lost the fear of the Lord. Nothing's reverent anymore. Every man's turned to his own way. Everybody makes it up as they go. <laughs> Father's calling and saying, no, come, repent, be converted, and your sins will be blotted out when the time of refreshing comes. He says, repent, be converted, that you may escape the wrath of God that's about to fall upon the unjust. I'm going to read that verse of Scripture to you. What is that? I know what that is. Do you know what that is? It's being tweeted right now on Twitter. It's 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Today God the Father pleads with you. He pleads with you. To be converted, to repent and be converted. Many people like the sin, like the way, like themselves, like their behavior, like who they are. I like not one single thing of me in this world. 
Not one thing. And God has given me a much better life. God gave me a much better. I wasn't stuck on me. I, me got exhausted. <laughs> me was done with me. And I heard Jesus calling me. And he, and he there showed me his love and his grace. And I collapsed in brokenness. And just being that much more disgusted with me. How could I even be allowed to come in your presence was what happened in my life. He invited me in, and there he changed me. Eli, Eli we saw with Isaiah, a seraphim came with a call from off the altar to cleanse and purge his iniquity so that he could stand without condemnation in the presence of the Lord with boldness and confidence. Something far better than a seraphim, a burning one. With far better things than calls from off the altar has come. Christ Jesus has come with his own blood to touch you, to cleanse you, to change you. But you've got to be needing it as much as he needed it. He said, oh no, I'm undone, I'm unclean. Oh no, I'm standing here in the presence of God. He was undone, man. I was undone. I was undone when I encountered Jesus. I had, I had called upon the name of the Lord and I'd been baptized many times. My daddy was a preacher. But when I, there was a period of time when I came to age in my life where I had an encounter with God and I was undone. And I wanted nothing more to do with my life. And he said, I've got the life for you. I'll give you my own. And I said, Lord, I'll take it. I'll take it. And he worked a miracle of salvation and gave me new desires, new appetites, New hungers, new thirst, new passion for living. I didn't want the things that everybody else wants. I wanted the things that's in his heart, the things that he wants. Father has the same conversion for you today. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And I, I really just want to read verse 10 to you. And I'm going to start at verse 8 just so that you can... Uh, I'm going to start at verse 6 just to kind of get the flow. Okay? And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Doesn't matter what you're going through. And those people are going through some hard stuff. When you have the Holy Ghost, you just joy in rejoicing. Amen. Hallelujah. He's filled my mouth with laughter. He has made me glad. Oh, he has made me glad. I will rejoice. I will have ecstatic joy and expressions of ecstatic joy because he made me glad. He filled me with this joy, you see. Hallelujah. No matter what you're going through when you have that. Come on, man. You can say whatever. You can say it's because of my life. That's why I'm so miserable. Or you can say ah, it's because of my husband. Or you can say it's because of my boss. Or you can say it's, you know, whatever. Come on. It's the car that I'm driving. Huh? No, 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 no. Man, when you've been touched and changed by the power of God, nothing can take that peace. Nothing can take that joy. Is it about all of the creature comforts anymore that makes you glad and happy and fills your soul with joy. It's about specifically and only that relationship and that interaction that you have with the almighty God. Christ Jesus being your elder brother, Holy Ghost being the one who's your mentor, God, teacher and master. That's the life. And nothing can interfere with that. No single person can get in the middle of that. No power of Darkness or angel can separate you from that when you want that and when that's your devotion and your desperate need. All these other things are nonsense excuses. All these other things are make-believe issues that people create in their mind and define for themselves of why they are in the state they are in. God says repent and be converted. Now you have to deal with that. What are you going to do with that? What I, what I do that is I say, man, let's go. Let's get to run into him. Let's, let's go. Let's run wide open to him. Hallelujah. Reality of it is this. Jesus said. He said that. The kingdom of heaven. Is like a bunch of people. On the outside of that realm of glory. 
And he says, they want to get in. But it's a very narrow way in. They can't come with all their stuff. You got to duck down and slide through. It's a narrow way in. So he says, be anxious about entering into the narrow gate. Because there's a lot of people standing outside. And only a few people come in. I have a fear of God. That has come from a relationship with him. See, Abraham had that. God says to Abraham, Abraham, now I know that you fear me. Because you won't withhold anything from me. Abraham came to worship and give all that he had. Not some of what he had. All that he had. Today we're going to give you an opportunity before the end of the meeting to worship the Lord with a tithe of that which He's given you. But it's supposed to represent all that you have. It's supposed to be given in a heart in the same kind of attitude as though you were giving it all. Many times it's not. It's given reluctantly, begrudgingly. The Lord says, I don't want it. I don't want it. That's what He says. I don't want it. I don't want it. He established worship, but he said to Israel one day, I don't want you coming here no more. And everybody's going, what? What is the prophet saying? He prophet saying, God doesn't want you coming here no more. He's got to be false prophet. Of course God wants us coming here. No, no, no. Papa says, Papa says that your sacrifice is like cutting off a pig's head. What? What? That guy's having a bad day. No, word of the Lord. Well, I thought, I thought you wanted us to come. I do want you to come. I want you to come with a right heart. I want you to come with a heart that desires to know me, to do what's right, to be empowered by me, to be taught my ways, to be taught how to live out the life that I live. Rather, you've fallen out in the legions to the powers of darkness, <laughs> to the rebellion of the age. To come and worship the Lord with everything that you have, you must fear Him. You must fear Him. I fear Him. I reverence Him. I respect Him greatly. When we were little, we used to go climb these really high trees and jump into the river. You had to learn a lot of respect for that, you're going to get hurt. When we were younger, we used to go surf huge waves. We're crazy people. And we had to learn a lot of respect because you get hurt. We did all these wild things. But we all, there was always a reverence and a respect for it. Men have reverence. You have, you've done, you have things you have reverence and respect for. You probably have a reverence and respect for how you drive down the highway. Huh? You probably have reverence and respect for how you spend your money so that you don't end up at the end of the month not being able to pay your bills. I don't know what all you might have reverence and respect for, but could you be in awe of God? Not without the power of the Holy Ghost coming in to your life because the powers of darkness, the God of this world is not going to allow you to see Him. You're not going to be in awe of Him. But when that is broken off of you, you'd be in awe. You'd behold His glory. And this would be the most wonderful thing it would define life for you. Oh, Father, we pray today in Jesus' name that every person have this experience in you. He says, For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only to Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place, your faith to God were to spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead even Jesus which delivered us from the wrath to come. That's why Jesus died. Jesus died at Calvary so that you and I could be born again. He died at Calvary so that you and I could be converted. He died at Calvary so that you and I could escape the wrath that is to come. He died at Calvary so that we could be changed. And if you're not changed, you have not received what he died for you to have. You got stuck in religion. 
Religion will not result in you making heaven any more than a Hindu, any more than a Buddhist, any more than an agnostic, an atheist, any more than a person who worships a tree or a blade of grass. You must be converted. Every person in Israel right now, every Jewish person... No matter that, though they know the true God from the Old Testament, they have rejected Christ Jesus, and without Him, they have, can, there's no way they can be saved because there's no way they can have a heart change without Christ Jesus. There's no way a Buddhist can be saved, for there's no way a Buddhist can have a heart change without Jesus. There's no way that a Muslim uh, can be saved because he can't have a heart change without Jesus. You call upon the name of Jesus in sincerity and truth. And God the Holy Ghost comes and works a miracle. And that miracle is suddenly you receive a new heart and a new spirit. And God, Christ Jesus, God the Holy Ghost... God, the Father, the very Spirit of the living God, comes and dwells on the inside of us. Did you know that if your spirit goes out of your body, your body will be dead? Did you know that? Of course you know that. You know, something like that, something happens like that. If your eyes were open, you'd be able to actually see it. Your spirit leaves. The spirit of an animal. When an animal dies, it has a spirit, it leaves. It's very different from a human being because they're not in the same arena of dealing with the powers of sin and darkness and choosing allegiance with them. Man has a will. God has given you a gift to create whatever world you want to create. And Father's looking for somebody who said, Lord, I want you to create the world for me. Father, I want your will to be done in my life. People think it's good enough just because they can say, Four our fathers and three hail somebody. <laughs> and I hope you don't think that I, I hope that you think that I'm disrespecting your religion because I am. Because it isn't about all of that s- stuff, nonsense. It's about whether or not you called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity and truth which resulted in America's salvation taking place. If you have any doubts about it, if you have any questions about it, you can come to the altar as many times as you want to till you get it. Because I'm going to tell you here today, I have no question or doubt about my transformation. And I have the fruits and the evidence in my life that what God described in His Word is happening in my life. And any place in my life that I see something going on that's not what God described concerning the person who's been born again, I change. I conform. I come under Holy Ghost conviction. Huh. If there's anything we need here in San Diego, California, is Holy Ghost conviction. But when the atmosphere is charged with rebellion, it's hard to have conviction. For when, a heart, when, it, when an atmosphere is charged with rebellion and defiance, there is no fear of God. When the church itself, the church, has lost a place of fearing God of recognizing them, of divine order and reverence, of themselves being taught of the Holy Ghost and and being willing to live right and be corrected. There can be no conviction. Because you know what conviction does? Conviction is a stingy source of of correction. Huh? It is the most intense correction you can ever experience called conviction. It says, you wrong. It says, you wrong, but here's the possibility and the privilege to change. Condemnation says, you wrong, out of here. Are you going to hear me? Condemnation says, you wrong, get away from me. That's not heaven. Heaven is, you wrong, now here's the provision to get right. Here's the provision to get right. To have your sins blotted out and washed away in the precious blood of Jesus. So that now you can go and live right. Amen. Amen. So you can say, our Father which art in heaven, sacred is your name. And not mean it. And not know it. 
and it not be true. And you don't care nothing about his holiness. Nor his power, nor really recognize his authority that he has. And his hatred and indignation against sin. Huh? You can say all you want. Your will be done in my life. Just as it is in heaven. And it not mean a single real genuine thing to you. Because you're not willing to change. Because when you say, Father, you will be done in me. That's a different kind of life. I want your will now, not my will. What will you choose? Christ Jesus came with a message, message saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The prophets of old came with the message saying, Repent, turn for you wickedness to serve the living God. Jesus Christ came. John the Baptist came saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The, the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ went around preaching, repent, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Today, I stand here saying, repent and be converted. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That your sins may be blotted out. I want you to stand with me. Father, I thank you that you have granted the gift of repentance unto life. That if any single person should call upon your name, I want everybody to be careful here because it's the most important time for me. And for you. That even exists. For souls are weighed in the balance. In this place. There may be people here today. You'll never have another opportunity. To receive the miracle. Of such great provision. The miracle of change. God wants to give you an opportunity to know Him. And all you have to be willing to do is call upon His name in sincerity and truth. And He will answer you. And, and, and maybe, maybe you call and nothing happens. Well, you call and nothing happens because you're not right in your heart. Because you still regard sin. You're still holding on to sin in your heart. You have to get serious with God. You have to get serious with God. But if you're serious, if you said, I'm done with sin. I'm done with evil. I'm done with the way that I've been living. I'm done with blaspheming His holy name. I'm done with living in a realm called darkness. And you call upon God in desperation to be saved. It's like calling on God because you you, you're drowning. And you're desperate to be saved. You're going to drown unless somebody saves you. That's You're going to get saved then. You call upon God because all around you, you see your enemies about to destroy you. And unless he comes and helps, you're dead. You'll get saved. People want to make it this little religious, oh, okay, yeah, well, you know, yeah. Well, I better make sure. I don't believe in that. I don't believe in that. I believe in repent. Turn from your sin. Turn from your idols. Turn from your own ways and self-interest to serve the living God. Father, I ask that Holy Ghost conviction fall upon this place right now in Jesus' name. Father, I ask you that in your mercy and your grace, every person's life will be examined by you right now. And that those who do not know you will begin to call out for you to come and help them. And begin to call out for salvation and will not stop, not let go till the reality of change strikes their soul. And it'd be more than just a drive-through experience with you. Or come up to the front and say a couple of words and we think we got it done. Oh God! We pray in Jesus' name. The truth will be in the inward parts. 
that the reality of heaven and the consequence of sin will strike the souls of men beginning in your house, beginning in your church, beginning first among your people and spread throughout this city and this, and this county and this region and this state and this nation. Have you seen what's going on on the television? On the television commercials? There's more families now represented with man and man, Mr. Man and Mrs. Man and their kids. Yeah. There's been about four of them during the Olympics because I've been watching the Olympics. Mr. Mom and Mrs. Mom and their children. Just flashes up, then you have a normal man and woman. Then man and man, man and woman, then woman and woman. You know what? It's because you and I have lost conviction. Because we, we, God called us, the church, the hinderer of iniquity. And when the church, when the walls have been, have been, have been, have been, have been built with untempered mortar, they fall and collapse at the slightest wind of opposition. Then we open the door and allow the enemy to flood in. I tell you, Pandora is out of the box, so to speak, in this nation. And only a few of us even know it. Just a few of us know it. Everybody else is still trying to figure out what they're going to do with their life. Come on, man. Awake. Awake. Put on your glorious garment. Don't you understand the hour in which we live? Don't you understand the trial and the time in which we find ourselves right now? Listen, I'll tell you, I praise God for those of you who went out yesterday, knocked on doors, calling people to repentance. Calling people to repentance. And you called them in a way that, that, that you could. Maybe it was just an invitation to come to the meeting. Maybe you actually said, God's calling you, He loves you, He wants you to come to Him. Maybe it went even deeper. I praise God for you and I pray that you'll allow it to go up in a greater intensity because unless this is being done, there's no hope. There's no hope. There are some men of God which I honor greatly who say the hour has already passed. The, hand, the writing is on the wall. The judgment's already gone forth. There's no turning back. I respect them. But I actually believe that a miracle could still happen. But you're either going to get desperate right now with your, with your clothes and your food and your jobs and your money and all the other stuff you trust in, or are you going to get desperate because you're going to be in a city where the grocery stores have no food in them at all. And there's no gas station and there's no job and there's no provision and you're going to be digging in the dirt for grub worms. Because when you get hungry, grub worms are tasty. Nice and sweet. I know it's hard to imagine that, but it's true. It's true. I've been in, there's third world countries where people have diets, grub worms and spiders. Believe it. Spice up the soup. And I'm not saying that because I'm trying to coerce people into making a decision. I'm not, I'm just telling you, this is what's going down. I'm not really even talking to the lost right now. I'm talking to those who are supposed to be found. I'm saying, where is your passion? I'm talking about where is your earnestness? I'm talking about where is, there, where is there any kind of awareness for reality? The writing's on the wall. Jesus said, Jesus said, I've not come to call the righteous, I've come to call sinners to repentance. This is my ministry. He says, but woe on you, Chorazan. Right on the strange phrase. Woe in you, Chorazan, for if the mighty deeds had been done in Tyre and Sidon that were done in you, it would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. It should be more tolerable for them in the day of judgment than for you. Christ God has going to judge every man by Christ Jesus, who he rose up from the dead. Christ Jesus rose from the dead, proving that he had the power to transform my lives. That he would be the judge of every man, both of the dead and of the living. 
He would think that God's going to change, change something different about us because we took communion. No, he's not. In fact, the judgment's going to be greater on you if you took communion and continued on in your sin and your own manner of living. He said it'd be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what he said. That's what Jesus said. God hates diverse weights and measures. People say, oh, we live in grace right now. So that means because we live in grace, we can continue doing whatever we want to do and we're right. That's not true. Oh, because we're not under the law. That's not true. That's false doctrine. And the tens of thousands go to it. And one simple statement of a word of wisdom can, can bring that, that house of cards down. Well, then what happened in the days of Noah? They had no law. There's no law. Father still hated sin then, just like he hates it now. I find it interesting. I find it interesting that as far as I know, the first theatrical performance of our movie about Noah is being produced. I find it interesting. Because I'm telling you right now, we 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 fast approaching those days. What, what are we going to do, people? Come on. Come go with me to my father's house. There's an anointing there to break the yoke in my father's house. There's an authority there to bring bring down these principalities and powers of darkness in my father's house. Amen. Amen. Just lift your hands towards heaven. Let Jesus touch you now. Let Jesus touch you now. It's your opportunity. Let Jesus touch you now. He loves you. He cares deeply for you. He works a miracle for you right now. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I break every stronghold of deception, every power of darkness from off of you. And I tell you right now in Jesus' name, you go free from your prison. You go free from the powers of darkness. You go free from every unholy thing right now in Jesus' name so that you may choose now to be born again. Choose now to follow Him, to live a different kind of life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Haragoshe Mangele Made. Salagi Mande Lobo Rubanashai. Say, Lord, Lord Jesus, I choose to follow you, to live for you for the rest of my life by your strength. By your power, by your divine grace. Amen. Hallelujah. Ah, God, we praise you for the change. We thank you for the power of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. <laughs> But we want to pray for anybody who needs prayer. You, you want us to pray with you because you want to get right with God? We'll pray for you. You want us to pray for you because you're sick or diseased? We'll pray for you. Tonight we're going to have special service just devoted to praying for the sick. I'm going to be ministering on the word of faith. People need to understand how to have the word of faith in their mouth, which is the proclamations of faith. I want you to come back tonight. We want to see God take you to a whole other approach, to a whole other level. In, in His goodness and in His grace. I want, you, I want you to find a way to enter into His presence with joy and rejoicing and singing. Find that wonderful grace that allows you to interact with heaven. Hallelujah. Be filled with joy.
love, all time, peace, goodness. Just the wonderful presence of the Lord. Just See, be, it's real simple. Being filled with the presence of the Lord, immediately you're filled with all of those things. Love, joy, peace. It's just that simple. It's not like, well, now we've got to work on love. Now we're going to work on joy. Now we're... Hallelujah. Well, we want you to come worship the Lord with your tithes and offerings. Find a bunch of people that you don't know. Hug them. Tell them that you love them. Bless them in Jesus' name. Once again, once again, if you want us to pray with you and for you, we're here to pray with you and for you. Just come. We'll pray with you and for you.